Today's topic that I'm going to speak about is cover crops as livestock forages. What I wanted to cover with you today is primarily why would we consider using cover crops as forage in the first place? And I think the biggest benefit to doing that is that we have dual benefits in that case. We benefit the soil health and then we can also meet the nutritional needs of our livestock. Whether you currently have livestock and are doing cover crops or you have cover crops and you're thinking about uh, incorporating livestock, either way there's ways we can make these systems work for both. Many of the crops that we choose to use as cover crops are high quality feedstuffs and they will meet the nutritional requirements of high performing livestock for much of their life cycle. We still need to do some testing on those forages to know how much is appropriate to feed um, and if we need to do additional supplementation, but is, as a general rule, many of them are very high quality. Another benefit of using cover crops as forage is that it also extends the opportunity for folks to fit the grass fed market, uh, which a lot of people are trying to do. And um, that, no matter how you feel about the idea of grass fed meats, it is a marketable avenue. So incorporating the use of cover crops as forage can help you continue to fit that definition of grass fed while using traditional forage. The great thing is about cover crops is it decreases the need for purchased feed. So if you're already in the livestock um, market, then you need to continue to feed your animals and anywhere that we can cut costs um, is gonna benefit, benefit our bottom line at the end of the day. Moving forward, I just wanted to show you this as an example of some sheep grazing, a common cover crop. This is turnips at the Eastern Ag Research Station. And this photo was taken at the end of December. Uh, so utilizing those cover crops can extend your grazing season well beyond what traditionally think of in our pasture systems in Ohio. And while this example is not planted in a crop field, it's uh, very similar to what you could envision in a crop system where you can set up some very simple lines of fence to allow the animals limited access to move through and um, utilize those forages. And then with good weather, you can get some regrowth and actually come back and graze again in some cases. But there are challenges, of course, as with everything that go along with trying to use cover crops as forage. Our planting and our harvest timings may not cooperate with the weather. It seems like nothing we do anymore actually cooperates with the weather. I know Aaron Wilson is on uh, watching the webinar and we, as a response to that, we have to be willing to push those recommended boundaries. When you open the agronomy guide and you look for the planting dates of these crops as forages, they don't necessarily line up with when you would plant them as cover crops. So we could have some issues with stand failures, but we could have a lot of benefit of, of potential for success. So we have to be willing to ride that line of this may or may not work, but if it works, it's going to be great. So in many cases, I think it is worth the risk to try. Another challenge is that our rations that we offer our animals are going to need to be adjusted. It should be a gradual change as you start to incorporate those cover crops, regardless of whether they are actually grazing the cover crops or if you're harvesting it and feeding it in a bunk. Anytime we change the diets of livestock, we cause a disruption to the digestive system. And we wanna make that as gradual as possible every time we change feeds. And that's no different with transitioning to feeding the cover crop. Probably the biggest challenge that we face using cover crops as forage is that the moisture levels are often very high and that makes drying the forage down very difficult. And uh, we've listened to a lot of excellent talks from forage experts this uh, fall, winter, and early spring about the benefits of using wet forages and ways to preserve those. And um, there's lots of risks also associated with those. But when done well, you again, have the ability to feed a high quality for your livestock can be worked for a longer period of time. So whether you're looking at grazing or harvesting, 
you need to be considerate of the fact that there is a lot of water in those forages. So when it comes to pounds of feed consumed by the animal, much of that mass is going to be water. Um, so they will likely eat more of these wet forages than they would of a dry forage because so much of it is water. So consider grazing, wrapping, or ensiling the forages um, as the better means of harvest because it, you're not gonna get these things to dry down. When it comes to equipment, be cautious about the investments that you make in equipment because often we can exceed the value of the forage crop by buying more equipment or securing more equipment. So be cognizant of that before you go gung-ho with a new idea because um, that's an easy way to sink too much money in your system and have it not pay back to you. So if there's the ability to rent, borrow, retrofit current equipment, do some type of a cost share program with a neighbor, um, or decide that you're gonna commit to this for the long term, have those in your um, toolbox of things to consider because it's gonna take a while to recoup those costs if you decide to invest in a new piece of machinery. In our area, we have great options to rent and borrow equipment um, on small scales. But as you move farther west, the, the fields are much bigger. You're gonna meet, need much bigger equipment. Um, and I'm sure that it's a little uh, more difficult to secure those as options. When it comes to selecting our crop and questions to address, we do wanna think about, are we going to graze these forages or mechanically harvest them? If you don't have access to fence and water, then grazing these forages is gonna be a difficult option. If you don't have the equipment to mechanically harvest the forages and store them, then utilizing cover crops as forage is probably not gonna work. But there are many potential ways that you can make this work. If you're going to mechanically harvest the forages, we need to think about how they're gonna be stored and how they're going to be fed. Um, as I mentioned, they're very difficult to dry down. So making sure that they are stored in a way they're not going to mold is important. And um, the, the ratios in which you feed them, we need to make sure that we're not feeding those cover crops to extremely hungry animals right off the bat because you could have some issues uh, with digestion, with bloat, uh, things like that. So we wanna be smart about how we feed those and how we store those. If we're choosing to graze the forages, we really have to pay attention to do we have adequate fence? Do we have an adequate charge on that fence if it's electric to actually keep our animals in? And do we have access to water? It's likely that you'll need to use some kind of a, like a camel uh, to transport water out to the field so they can have access. Or if you're limiting the time they spend on the field, maybe you don't need to provide water. If they're only out for a couple hours and then you're bringing them back to um, a different area, they can get water in that other area. Since so much of this forage is water, they likely won't need to drink that much as they're grazing. Um, but if you have them out there all day, then they certainly are gonna need some water. More about selecting your crop. What I've done here is uh, pulled some of the most common cover crops that are also valuable forages and put them on this chart. And uh, all the information here is sourced from OSU Extension. And you'll notice that what's displayed are the species, their value as grazing material, and their value as harvested forage. So depending on which option you think you wanna go with, grazing or harvesting, you can go through this chart and choose what looks good to you. Now be aware that many of these grow at different times of year. So our annual rye, that's gonna be, um, you, you can see that in either spring or you can seed it in the fall, but that's gonna have a much different time frame for seeding than sorghum Sudan grasses. This is a warm season grass, so it's only gonna grow during the summer. So if you plant that in the fall, you're gonna be definitely disappointed. So as you go through this chart, you can select grazing versus harvest, and then you can go through and find those that are very good, or excellent on either category, and then look up the specifics on each of those crops. What would be required? Uh, do you have the equipment available? Does this meet the nutritional needs of the livestock you have? Um, and then use that information to make a good decision for you. 
When it comes to tillage in the system, no-till and minimal till seeding are, of course, desirable, and we're going to try to do that most likely if we're in a conservation tillage system of some kind. But keep in mind that seed placement is critical, as it is with all other crops. One of the biggest causes of stand failures of all forages is planting the seed too deep. And we need to make sure we manage our crop residue in a way that's going to be conducive for seeding. If we're broadcast seeding this um, and we have a lot of residue on the surface, that's going to interrupt the ability for the seed to make good contact with the soil. So in that case, a no-till drill would be highly recommended. And um, you can consider chisel plowing or disking, which could be helpful if you have a lot of residue on top. Don't get too carried away and don't do it too early before seeding. We want that soil to stay in place, but we also want our seed to germinate. So trying to get the best possible seed to soil contact as we can without disrupting the whole purpose of using our cover crop is important. I threw some information in here about anticipating fertility needs. And uh, I did that because my first ever public talk on cover crops that wasn't specifically related to wildlife food plots was at Nathan Brown's uh, field day for cover crops in Highland County this past August. And they'd asked me to talk about fertility needs of cover crops. Well, clearly your fertility needs are going to vary based on your specific location, your field, and what cover crop you're utilizing the crop that comes before and the crop that comes after. But when you're looking at your site, make sure that you're choosing cover crops that fit what you currently have and not what you wish to have. Look at your pH and your, your soil types, the fertility levels that should remain after the previous crop was harvested and what you're subjecting that seed to. We need to um, select those that work in the conditions that we have. And as you're doing soil tests to try to figure this out, add on what cover crops you have anticipated after your main crop is harvested. That's gonna help you develop those recommendations for the long term. When it comes to util utilizing legumes, if you get inoculated legumes, you should not need to add additional nitrogen than what is already present. Um, Make sure that the legumes that you choose are inoculated, especially if the previous crop was uh, not a legume. So if you're planting a cover crop after corn, there's not going to be those beneficial soil microbes um, for the legumes to form their relationship with. But if it was after soybeans, there could be some. But also those, um, those bacteria are sometimes species specific. So just go ahead and get the inoculated seed. It's worth the extra cost to ensure that you have what's necessary for success. You may need to add some additional potassium for legume crops. They uh, do need more potassium than grasses do to be successful. In some cases, your grasses may need some starter nitrogen to, to get kick-started. But if you have nitrogen left over from the previous crop, you may not need that starter nitrogen. If you are cutting that crop for harvest and transporting it to another area, it is possible that they need some nitrogen in between harvest periods to keep that crop actively growing. So it seems kind of silly that we would plant a cover crop to try to prevent excess a loss of nutrients and then apply a nutrient to it. But when you weigh your costs and your benefits, if you're trying to have a successful forage system and get maximum growth, it may be worth the additional application to carry out that growth period of the cover crop for a little bit longer. Really, this is going to depend on your specific situation, your wants, your needs, and, and what type of livestock that you're feeding. It's important to know what your purpose is when you're thinking about fertility. And I made this decision tree. It's extremely easy to think about. So first question is, are you going to harvest this forage? Yes or no? If the answer is no, most likely you're not going to need to apply fertilizer. If the answer is yes, your likelihood is higher because you are taking that crop off, removing it, and putting those nutrients somewhere else. That may be exactly your goal, 
or it could be creating a little bit of a deficiency in the system. So play that uh, by your own situation, judging by soil tests and um, nutrient removal in your cases. What we have here is a chart that's developed by our uh, forage specialist from Ohio State, Mark Schultz. He created this uh, when we were trying to come up with solutions for prevent plant acres. And it's a very nice comprehensive chart that includes many common forage crops, what the seeding rate should be for those crops, what the ideal planting dates are, their planting depths, how much nitrogen should be applied, their dry matter yields, which this is important if you're trying to figure out how to fit it in your feeding program, if you have enough to sell or if you need to keep it all, your crude protein levels, and also your neutral detergent fiber values. This is gonna tell you a lot about digestibility of the forages and if it's going to meet the production needs of your livestock through their different growth stages. And you can see that we've got values that go all the way from 6% crude protein up to 20. And 20% um, crude protein is gonna be very close to meeting the needs of most classes of livestock in most of their uh, production phases of life. So that's good to see. But when you look at neutral detergent fiber, those levels vary even more so. When we see numbers that are higher, that means more fiber is present. When we see numbers that are lower, in this case, it means there's a lot more water present. So these ones at the bottom, these are all brassica crops, and they are significantly more water um, when you do that dry matter percentage than grasses are. You can access uh, this chart. It's available online at the Forges website. If you go to, um, I actually have the, web, the website link at the end of the presentation, so I'll show you that. And all the information here is sourced from the agronomy guide. Some tips for you if you're considering utilizing the grazing option. Strip grazing with temporary and movable fence is ideal if you can manage that. It's great for the animals, the soil, and you as a manager. Utilizing strip grazing is gonna help those animals adjust slowly when you expose them to a new feed source. It's gonna aid in getting the manure evenly distributed across the field, so you benefit again from the addition of nutrients. Uh, you can easily change the grazing loads, uh, how fast the forages are growing, uh, how many animals you may have stocked at a time. It gives you a lot of flexibility to, to take into consideration all the things that Rory talked about this morning in his basic pasture management talk. You as the manager being in control of um, how long the animals graze, how much they have access to. That's a lot easier to manage in a strip, strip grazed situation. It's also going to promote even foot traffic, which is going to help improve your ability to fully use that forage for all it's worth. When you limit their ability to move forward and pick and choose whatever it is they want, they're encouraged to eat everything that's there, um, which is gonna help you maximize the utilization. When using strip grazing, uh, we wanna make sure that we're leaving adequate residue. One, if we're trying to prevent soil erosion and two, if we intend to regraze the area at a later time. Some more tips. It is important to have some type of exterior fencing. Livestock have a way of getting out. And that is your responsibility as a manager. So making sure that you've got some type type of a barrier between you and the neighbors or you and the road is important. Uh, so I would not be comfortable saying go out and put one strip of poly wire around your cornfield to keep in a group of cows. They usually will respect one strand of, of tape if they've been exposed to it before, but what if they don't and they wind up out in the road and somebody hits one with their car? or they get into the neighbor's garden and gobble up all their cabbages or something. You don't wanna be in that situation. Consider your exterior fence um, if this is something you wanna pursue. Making sure that fresh, clean water is available and that you have species appropriate mineral 
is very important. Remember that a lot of these, the content of these forages are water, so they're not going to be as thirsty as they would be if they were just eating hay, but we should never restrict access to water. Um, and it can be an issue uh, to have mineral deficiencies or toxicities when you're changing diets. Those levels can get out of whack, so make sure that you're still providing that species appropriate mineral all the time. It may be that you need to provide additional fiber to help with the rate of passage. And what I mean, what I mean by saying rate of passage, I mean the time it takes from the time that forage is ingested by the animal and comes out on the other end. When much of the forage is water, the passage rate is increased. And what we're gonna see with that is very watery stool, diarrhea, it's gonna be very sloppy poop. Um, and so if you're milking cows, and you're bringing these animals in later, that's not really ideal. Um, and it also shows that they're not getting enough time to fully digest all the material that's in that forage. So adding some lower quality feed or just additional fiber to the diet may be necessary to even out that passage rate. Um, these are lambs that were weaned and then put directly out on these turnips. Um, this is Brady Campbell's one of his PhD studies where he's comparing um, how these wean lambs do on oats versus stockpiled tall fescue versus turnips um, mixed with ryegrass to see is that an option for um, weaning lambs. And I won't give away all of the information from his study, but the answer so far looks like yes, it is. And they actually have gained some weight in that system. Um, so that is just one example to show you that they do in fact eat those crops. Some tips about harvesting cover crops. The best time to harvest these crops is before they reach the reproductive stage. And that is the top factor that impacts forage quality. That's just the way the life cycle works. Once these plants go reproductive, developing the seed is the top priority and they're no longer really invested in the development of leaves and the tissue that we want our animals to eat. So in all cases, the best nutritional value of those forages is going to be at the point before they turn reproductive and develop a seed head. Drying down of cover crops is going to take extended time uh, compared to traditional forage crops. And this could pose problems for you during harvest and also after. It may not wanna pass through the machinery um, efficiently and you also may have issues with spoilage in storage. So educate yourself about how to use wet forages. We could talk for days about uh, how to manage that and I won't today, but we do have additional resources about how to do that if you're interested. Remember that when you remove forage and feed it in another place, the nutrients go with it. And that could be good or bad depending on your situation. If you have additional nutrients left over from the previous crop and you want them removed, great. But if your main goal is just to stabilize soil and we remove additional nutrients, that's gonna mean that you'll need to put some more on, perhaps more than you initially anticipated for the next crop. So continue to monitor uh, soil fertility as things go along. We also have information about the nutrient removal rates of many of those forages when you harvest them. So I mentioned it before and I'll mention it again. Forage testing, it is important, it's very important. Uh, we say this all the time in agriculture and other fields. You cannot manage what you do not measure. There is no way that we can be sure we're providing for the needs of our animals if we don't test that forage. Everything without a test is an assumption and many things with a test are still an assumption. Um, but we can get a lot closer to making the best decisions when we have that information available. Whether we are grazing that crop or we're feeding it out of the bunk, from my perspective, it is most definitely worth the time and the money that it takes to sample those forages. A good forage test is available for you for less than $25, and that is way less than the cost of one large round bale of hay, if you think about that. So, um, $25 is a small investment. If you think about how many things we spend $25 on that are worth much less, it's, it really puts it into perspective. 
Here's some of those links that I referred to earlier. If you are foraging for more forage information, these are the top places I recommend you go for information that comes out of Ohio State. The go.osu.edu link goes to the Forages website. The beef.osu.edu link goes to the beef team and sheep.osu.edu goes to the sheep team. So um, please check these resources out. Each one of these is a um, encyclopedia of information. You can use the search bars on all of those websites to find specific topics, type in keywords, type in author names, and you can spend hours and days of your self-quarantine period reading up on whatever topic related to forages that you want. And if you're curious, uh, in the background of the zone, you can see the, the grass that's mowed off here, that's tall fescue. The yellow flower there is bird's foot trefoil, and the white flower is just a traditional Dutch white clover. Um, those are all excellent multi-use forages, ground covers, lawns. Um, it could even possibly be a cover crop in your situation, depending on what you want to do. Here are some uh, publications that I have found to be really helpful. This is the link to that printable chart. You can just bring it up, you can screenshot it, you can print it out, um, stick it in whatever materials you take with you to the store when you buy seeds. Um, this publication, it's very large. So if you choose to download that, be aware. It's like, I believe over 200 pages long, but it, it, is, it is a wealth of knowledge. It has specific um, crop profiles on many common cover crops, including how to plant them and their nutritional value and what fertilizer value they add or, or what they need. Um, excellent to check out if you're in cover crops for the long haul and trying to figure out how to make a profit utilizing them. Our cover crop field guide is available here at this link. You'll see it's housed at Purdue, but that is a multi-state publication, including work from Ohio State. And of course, our agronomy guide. This is the link to the 15th edition. Uh, you do have to purchase this one. You can find free versions, but they are older. And this one actually contains up-to-date chapters on forages. So I suggest if you're going to get one and download it, get the newest one. This is my contact information. If you have additional questions specifically for me or things come up later on that you didn't think of today, feel free to, to reach out and contact me. As I said, I'm not a cover crops expert, but I am very passionate about forages. And um, if you're thinking about trying to work this into a system on your farm, I would encourage you to at least explore the options um, and see if it could be a profitable venture for you. We have a playlist of videos as well. If you're more of a visual learner and you prefer to watch people do things to learn how to do them yourself rather than read about them, I'd suggest checking the playlist out. If you click on this link or you uh, scan this QR code, it will take you to the playlist where all of the Forge Focus videos are housed. Forge Focus is a TV show that's produced once a month. We have not done our March 2020 video, unfortunately, due to COVID-19. But we have, I think, 21 other half an hour programs available that you can watch from the comfort of your couch. And um, each one pretty much has a special guest and their contact information is listed at the end of each video. So we want you to feel connected with us and know that we're available to help you however we can.